Welcome everybody. On behalf of La Trobe University's Institute for Agriculture and Food, it gives me great pleasure to welcome everyone to this virtual launch of the International Service for the Acquisition of Agri-Biotech Applications, an organisation known as ISA. The brief 55 global status of biotech crops and the oceanic perspective. My name is Tony Basic. I'm the director of the La Trobe Institute for Ag and Food and the moderator. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge on behalf of La Trobe University, the traditional custodians of the lands where its campuses are located in Victoria. We recognise that Indigenous Australians have an ongoing connection to the land and the university values their unique contribution both to the university and the wider Australian society and to the custodianship of our unique biodiversity. How we will feed the growing population Estimated to reach 10 billion by 2050, that is an increase of 25% on the next over the next 30 years, but requiring 70% more calories. And how we do this with sustainable and nutritious food is an extremely important issue for the peoples of the Indo-Pacific region and indeed the planet. Particularly as we try to reduce the impact of human activities on the environment and promote healthy diets as a preventative medicine for human health. Safeguarding food security and nutrition is critical in order for countries to overcome problems of hunger and malnutrition, estimated to impact 2 billion people today. That is approximately a quarter of the world's population. Socioeconomic benefits of biotech crops have been documented in the last 23 years by ISA showing that biotech crops have contributed to increasing productivity that contributes to global food, feed and fibre security, supporting self-sufficiency on a nation's arable land, conserving biodiversity, precluding deforestation and protecting biodiversity sanctuaries, mitigating the challenges associated with climate change and improving economic health and social benefits. These economic benefits health improvements and social gains obtained through biotech crop adoption must be made known to the global community so that farmers and consumers can make informed choices on what crops to grow and consume respectively. To the policy makers and regulators to craft enabling biosafety guidelines for commercialisation and adoption of biotech crops and to the science communicators and the media to facilitate correct and effective dissemination of the benefits and potentials of the technology so that consumers have the information to make informed choices. Today you will hear from research experts and a farmer in agriculture and food production about how biotech GM approaches are doing just that. The COVID-19 pandemic, a global crisis, has exposed the fragility of global supply chains the national importance of food security and a strong manufacturing base to value add to our largely commodity-based agri-food sector. This crisis has jolted our thinking on many fronts. And as we emerge out of this crisis, which we will more rapidly than anticipated only a short time ago due to the development of vaccines by GM technologies, do we revert to the status quo or do we dare to do things differently and grasp a unique opportunity for the planet's agri-food sector to produce clean, safe and nutritious premium quality foods? This webinar launch summarising the benefits accru accrued through the introduction of biotech GM crops is indeed prescient. More than two in five consumers globally are spending more time cooking and preparing food at home. I know I am. Instead of getting takeaway and going out, consumers are experimenting with recipes and cuisine as they spend more time at home. Internationally, export and import markets have changed dramatically this year as our supply chains that are based upon an on-demand need have been found inadequate. And so is the realization that we need to challenge ourselves to think differently about what we eat, how we produce food, and our own consumption and the ways that we do that, which can be sustainable and viable in the long term. One thing is for certain in these very uncertain times, business as usual is not an option. So with that, I'd like to introduce our speakers who are presenting today, Dr. Paul Tang from ISA. Paul is the Managing Director of 
NIE International and an adjunct senior fellow at the Center for Non-Traditional Security Studies, both at Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. He's also a senior fellow, Southeast Asian Regional Center for Graduate Study and Research in Agriculture in the Philippines. He specializes in food security, agri-technology innovations and sustainable bioentrepreneurship. Paul obtained his undergraduate degrees and his PhD from the University of Canterbury in New Zealand. The second presenter will be David uh, Jonicky, who's the Vice President of the National Farmers Federation in Australia and former President of the Victorian Federation, Farmers Federation. David is a third generation grain and livestock farmer who operates a family property at Murrawarra in Northwest Victoria. His undergraduate studies in applied science and was awarded a scholarship from Nuffield, Australia and the Australian Rural Leadership Program. And David advocates for the enhanced awareness and confidence in the farm sector and the growth of the national economic, social and environmental value of the industry. The third speaker, before we switch to a panel presentation, will be Professor Jim Whelan, who is the Research Director of the La Trobe Institute for Agriculture and Food. With a background in agri-biosciences, Professor Whelan's expertise in the field is evidenced by close to 250 papers in high impact journals over a career that spans 25 years, focusing on mitochondrial function and signaling of plant energy and stress status. Professor Whelan's La Trobe's theme leader for the production of quality foods and medicines is the research director of the La Trobe Institute for Ag and Food and also the research director of our ARC Research Hub for Medicinal Agriculture, and a chief investigator in ARC Centre of Excellence in Plant Energy Biology. In 2019, he was elected as a fellow to the Australian Academy of Sciences. So without further ado, I'll pass you over to Paul Peng to present the, Oce the Australian Oceana Report. Uh, let me join Tony in welcoming all those who have signed in for this webinar. Uh, it's a real opportunity uh, this afternoon to share with you highlights of the global status of commercialized biotech GM crops in 2019. Okay. I think uh, certainly COVID-19 has reminded us of how important biotech crops are in contributing to so many aspects of important issues. I think Tony mentioned population growth, there's climate change, which Australians are well aware of you know, food insecurity. And of course, in the last few years, we've seen the increase in, in, in the hungry in the world. So all these are important issues for which biotech crops can make a very important contribution. In the short time I have this afternoon, I'm just gonna share with you, basically on the uh, adoption status in 2019, uh, some highlights of important crops and trades and talk a little bit about future prospects. In 2019, 190.4 million hectares of biotech crops were grown worldwide in 29 countries by up to 17 million farmers, spread out quite a bit. Uh, and uh, for a few years now, the developing countries have exceeded the industrialized countries in terms of the area under biotech crops, as shown in this uh, particular graph here. Uh, and uh, if you go back to the previous graph, in fact, it's 55.5% in developing countries and 44.5% in industrial countries. Now this next slide basically highlights the adoption status. There was a slight decrease in 2019, mainly caused by decreases in area in, in Australia and uh, in the USA. But overall, since 1996, there's been a 112-fold increase in the overall area of, of uh, biotech crops, resulting in a cumulative area of about 2.7 million hectares. And this figure is significant because the large area of biotech crops that has been grown has seen no evidence whatsoever of negative effects that have been scientifically proven. And that's a very important factor. Now, if we look at the, the regional performances, Latin America and North America are now almost equal in terms of the spread uh, of, uh, of biotech crops. And of course, that's followed by Asia Pacific, 
with about 10.23%, made up of some nine countries that are growing about their crops in Asia Pacific. Of course, you know, despite all the bad press, there are two EU countries that are growing biotech crops. And then six countries in Africa with three new countries, which is really 100% increase above uh, the previous year. Uh, this map of ISA you know, has been uh, downloaded many times. And what it also shows is that there are 19 what we call mega countries, those countries that have more than 50,000 hectares of biotech crops. And there are not nine countries, Oh, sorry, 10 countries, sorry, with less than 50,000 hectares. The uh, top five countries that grow biotech crops are responsible for about 91% in fact of all the biotech crops in 2019. And as we can see, three developing countries, Brazil, Argentina, and India lead, in fact, the charge in terms of growing biotech crops, followed by two industrial countries, the USA and Canada. Oops, uh, I'm not sure what's happened, but I'm stuck now. I can't advance. Oh dear. Sorry, let me just try again. Here we go. Oops. Apologies for the technology. Okay. Now, despite the uh, slight decline in the global area of biotech crops, there have been some bright sparks. And this next slide shows that uh, these are three countries that have shown double digit increases in the biotech crop area, notably Vietnam with 86% increase in maize area, biotech maize, Philippines 39%, and Colombia a 15% increase comprising both maize and cotton. And maize is important because ISA has for years predicted now that maize is the next big frontier where there's lots of upsides for increases. Is important as not just a feed crop, but also a food crop. If we uh, unpack the figures recently a little bit more, what I said earlier that Latin America, you know, is not equivalent to what North America is growing in terms of area. And our anticipation is that Latin America may very soon exceed North America in terms of area grown. And, and the other important take home message yeah. I think from this slide is that the beyond the big four crops of uh, maize or corn, soybeans, cotton, and canola, we now see an expansion of growth in the other crops, the so-called minor crops. And this is significant. So apart from, from area, the diversity of GM crops has definitely increased, especially some of the crop in small areas, you know, things like eggplant, uh, safflower, sugarcane, and so on. Okay. Now, uh, with respect to the actual crops themselves, the big four continues to dominate to the global area, especially soybean, uh, followed by maize or corn, cotton, and then canola. In fact, biotech soybean occupies about 48% of global biotech area. Also noteworthy, I think in the uh, 2019 year, is that Brazil surpassed the US in terms of biotech soybean area uh, by some 15%. And our anticipation too is that, like I said earlier, Latin America is going to continue being a, a big force, I think, in terms of uh, supplying food and feed to the rest of the world. Looking at the uh, adoption rates of the, the four, the big four principal biotech crops, soybeans and cotton are the ones that have three quarters at least, I think, of the, uh, the total crop areas now under biotech crops. Maize, as I indicated earlier, is 31%, but it's a lot of upside, especially in Africa and, and in Asia. First, canola, 27%. So, yeah. And going closer to home, just the Asia Pacific, uh, there are 17 countries in this region that have formally adopted biotech crops in the Asia Pacific region in 2019. Of these 17 countries, nine are planting and eight are importing countries. And of course, you know, our aspiration is to see more of the importing countries also plant, uh, so that they, they reduce their dependency really on, on, on imports. In terms of trades, uh, the, the trade that is seeing the most uptick really are the stack trades. And I think hopefully later on our farmer participant will perhaps you know, be able to speak to this as well 
as to why farmers prefer stacked trades. I think in terms of economics uh, versus the single trades and how it helps them. So stacked trades in 2019 increased to some 44.7% of the, the total area of uh, biotech crops. The map again is quite interesting, showing the distribution, I think, uh, of uh, biotech countries. But basically, again, it illustrates the, the 19 uh, biotech mega countries and the countries that are, that are slightly more minor with uh, less than 50,000 hectares. Uh, again, you know, our hope is that eventually we're going to see an increase in the coloring of, of, the, of the map, especially in Africa and in Asia. Uh, I won't go into detail at all uh, on the figures themselves. But what is also interesting, I think, in 2019 was that we are evidencing an expansion uh, in adoption of the so-called small area minor crops by area. Uh, potatoes, for example, you know, the, the uh, non-browning potato, non-browning apples, small areas indeed, but significant. Uh, in Bangladesh, the uh, eggplant, the BT plant has increased significantly in area. And also with, with the resulting uh, effect that pesticide use on these plant, uh, plant uh, kind of farms have decreased significantly. Then is the alfalfa, low lignin alfalfa, which is the other important trait. And sugarcane, I think Brazil started planting insect resistant sugarcane. And, and also drought tolerant sugarcane in Indonesia, which is quite significant. Uh, there in itself, and of course with uh, safflower, high oil oil safflower, and then the pink pineapple in Costa Rica, which is again an interesting phenomenon there, because this pink pineapple is sweet irrespective of how much sunshine there is, apart from the nice cosmetics uh, associated with the pink pineapple. Uh, now, our emphasis has been on the areas grown in biotech crops, but the other important step to consider when we talk about biotech crops, really is the total number of countries that both not just grow, but also import and use biotech crops for food feed and, and processing. Okay, so, so today, some 72, 72 countries have issued 4485 regulatory approvals for some 32 GM crops. And this has happened since 1992. But with the US, of course, you know, having shown the most number of approvals, uh, actually followed closely by, by, by Japan. Uh, Mace has the largest number of approved events. And of course, the herbicide tolerant trait is the one that has shown the most uh, adoption. Uh, in 2019, there were some approvals and the planted areas will be reflected in our next report for 2020, hopefully in less than a year's time. And this showed traits like cotton drop tolerance, uh, Apple, not further non-browning, canola, omega-3, maize, you know, multi-insect resistance, with tolerance, cotton, and, and soybean. Uh, and this is just a partial list. In fact, there are others that were approved, uh, minor uh, events in 2019. Uh, in the pipeline, and, and, and I must say that the pipeline in many, especially developing countries, is both a long and deep pipeline. I think here are just uh, some examples, non-browning romaine lettuce, Colorado potato uh, beetle resistance and CPV is one of the most important tests that we all know of in potatoes. Then the drought tolerant wheat and rice, uh, nutrient use efficiency, water use efficiency, and also salt, salt, salt tolerance. Three very, very important traits indeed uh, for rice, which is still one of the most important stable crops uh, in the world. Uh, and, and I think. Tony partly alluded to this in terms of the contribution of biotech crops to food security, sustainability, and climate change. Here are just some highlights from data uh, released through Graham Brooks and, and his outfit there. You know, the increase in crop productivity, uh, the decreased use, decrease the use of crop protection products, especially pesticides, insecticides in this case, the conservation of biodiversity in terms of not having to cut down more forests uh, to grow crops. And then, of course, reduce CO2 emissions, equivalent to some 15.3 million cars being taken off the road. And of course, the alleviation of poverty and hunger. Uh, I think uh, Graham's data has shown that some 17 million farmers and their families uh, have been lifted out of, of 
poverty and hunger because of biotech crops. And I must say, you know, living here in Asia Pacific, that without biotech crops, we could not have met the demand in animal protein uh, that we see here in Asia Pacific because we import you know, over 70% of the world's soybeans in the Asia Pacific from the Americas. That's how important biotech crops are, soybean especially to us in Asia Pacific. Okay. So to ensure the continued economic benefits of biotech crops, we've got to continue making sure that the sound regulatory systems based on science, that the approvals have to look at benefits and not just risk. And of course, the productivity part, you know, with environmental conservation and sustainability, and the benefits that accrue to the millions of hungry and impoverished populations. These are all key considerations. I think we look at about that crops. And of course, the articulation by the Food and Agriculture Organization in this uh, seminal publication in 2017, challenges facing the future of agriculture. Biotech crops help to address all these challenges and more, in fact, because now with climate change, that we, you know, we see so many symptoms of in, in Asia Pacific. Uh, biotech crops increasingly, the tolerance to biotech traits, you know, like flood tolerance and so on, will become the important tools that, that we have in Asia Pacific. Uh, and of course, as FAO says, you know, we need whatever tools we have to meet the anticipated 50% increase in food demand by 2050. So with that, I believe I've used up my, my 15 minutes. Uh, thank you very much for listening. And we can take questions later on in the panel. So thank you very much for listening. Thanks very much. <laughs> That's a fantastic summary of where we're at. And it's pleasing to see the penetration of the uh, GM biotech crops into the developing countries and the benefits they bring. Next up will be David Jonicky, who's at going to give us a perspective from the coal face as a farmer and a major farmer in the Australian scene. Thanks for David, over to you. G'day, um, my name's David Johinke. Um, anyone who knows me calls me DJ because um, I've got a bit of a cracking last name and not even my primary school teacher could get it right for me. Um, I've been asked to speak about a farmer's perspective on biotech crops and I guess in many ways I'm going to give a perspective on uh, a bit of my previous life as the Victorian Farmers Federation president of where we had a lot of exposure and um, to when biotechnology first came into the state, mainly through canola, but then also my roles as both the National Farmers Vice President and I'm also involved in regional development and uh, in the water industry as well. So I want to frame this conversation a little bit through my sister's eyes. My sister lives down in Melbourne. Um, she's grown up basically off of the farm for a lot of her life and she, a lot of her friends, when I meet them, they've got questions for me. And it's always about the perception of farming and what we do and if it's the, the reality of uh, what I do as a person, let alone my industry and, and, and my business. Because at the end of the day, I love growing food, I love working with my hands, but ultimately I am also like everyone else here, I'm, I'm being employed, I'm, uh, I'm a business person and I want to make sure that I can run a, a sustainable uh, business for the long term. So when, um, when my sister, when I catch up with her friends and we have a bit of a chat, the first thing that always comes up is, um, when I can move the screen forward, farmer wants a wife. <laughs> How true is it that there's, that there's all these bachelors out there running around? The reality is, the reality is, yeah, there's a few of us, a few people running around out there, but this isn't the real life of, of agriculture. This isn't the real life of farmers. And then when I talk to one of his sons, Zach, he's, a real, he's real keen on farming, but his friends in Melbourne, the biggest exposure that they get is Farm Simulator uh, 2020, which is an awesome game. If you haven't tried it, um, it's probably the easiest way to make money in agriculture by um, doing it yourself. But they don't actually get droughts and they don't use too much biotech in, in Farm Simulator, unfortunately. And one of the things being in, in agriculture and, and in that agro-political sphere is I've obviously had to deal with a lot of legislation and Paul spoke about legislation in the pr prior um, presentation. And one of the biggest problems that we do have in the adoption of um, biotech is actually not only the process of getting it out to the field and trying it, but then also understanding it. And I guess in, in Australia, we, we've had this history of being very much connected to agriculture, very much connected to, to, um, to the life of the land and noting that 
we've actually had a prime minister once who actually ran a farm. He knew all about agriculture. And during that period, we had some huge uh, policy gains within agriculture that's actually held, held us in good stead for not only research and development, um, but also how we do uh, a lot of the, the aspects of uh, the future of agriculture where it's set up, let alone too noting that I lament the loss of the $2 note, the only Australian currency that actually celebrated um, what we did. And that was in a daily aspect of, the, of my sister, of her friends, of my nephew and his friends as well. So it brings us to what is public perception? And unfortunately, um, when, when I say I'm a farmer or I say that I'm using biotech, everyone goes to the negative straight away. The aspects of both breeding, using markers, trying to make sure that we are eliminating um, some bad traits, let alone promoting good traits in, in our products, always gets lost in that conversation. And I find myself a lot of the time having to explain what I do and how I do it and that I'm not actually a monster that's uh, trying to both poison the people who I'm trying to feed, but then let alone the environment that I'm also looking after. And things, especially around when we talk around glyphosate um, and use the chemical usage, th these are some of the, the key touch points that I continually have to both explain and also get through to the wider community. So how I use my language and what I use it for is really important as well. And that's one of the take home messages I'll hope people today also understand from our perspective is, now, when we're talking about biotech, it's the benefit of biotech, not just the reliance on science itself that actually sells, is this a good or a bad thing? And one thing that we are lacking in agriculture is heroes. We don't have enough people standing up for the benefits of what we do in agriculture and promoting the actual good. Unfortunately, a lot of the time, a lot of this happens by coincidence. So for me in my farm, the only two biotech crops that I am involved with is canola and safflower. The, the nine crops I grow, those are the only two. But when you've got the story like the safflower story where it wasn't necessarily a trait that was this searched for on the agronomic benefits, but of the broader scope of what can we actually use this crop for, for this oil, per, oil percentage or, or high oleic nature, let alone when you look in North America, how that crop's being used to, for pharmaceutical benefit. These are the hero stories that we need to tell. These are the things that we need the public to be talking about. And this is the focus that I believe um, as agriculture, as farmers, uh, as some of the greatest challenges that I have, let alone then the biotech industry itself. So when we talk about success and how we measure that, sometimes I'm talking in metric, other times people are talking in imperial. Now that's confusing enough when I'm working with my old man. But when we talk about that in the scheme of what are we trying trying to achieve with biotech, how is it meant to be benefiting both the, the farmers and its consumers sometimes gets lost in the language that we use and the intent of why we do what we do. So I, I also encourage us then to, to turn to how are we demonstrating what we are achieving in the right manner for the right clients or the right uh, customers. Now this can be tricky in the, the short term, but in the long term with the, the, the conversation that the Paul's had around once again, uh, trying to make sure we're stopping degradation, trying to ensure that the nutrition is, is front and centre. These are the languages that, this is the language that we need to use. These are the, the, the buzzwords in many ways that we, we, we have to focus on to make sure that we're getting cut through. And drought, yeah, drought is one of my biggest risks. And, and when I take a step back, it's when a drought occurs, things like frost tolerance is probably more important to me than any other thing because um, those extremes in temperature through climate change are some of my biggest influences on my final yield. The heat stress in spring takes more yield than not getting a rainfall to get my crops to a bigger size. So how do we manage that stress in the crop canopy? How do I make better decisions with the tools that I have noting that there's a whole suite of things that are around the corner but I don't have access to them yet. So I've got to keep in business until some of these things land, noting that um, climate change and the variability that it's presenting is something that's becoming more acute to my business. And that is actually taking, uh, taking different risk mitigation strategies um, into my hands, which means that I'm not necessarily maximizing yield. And unfortunately, yield is king and cash is king in my business. And if I can't do either of those two things, I don't have a long-term uh, model. So here are the seven things that I guess when I was asked to talk about biotech, they really want to emphasize on what, what makes the difference to me as a farmer. 
and that is getting that technology into the paddock. What percentage are we spending on and, and developing these techniques? How much of that is actually hitting my paddock versus producing peer reviewed papers and journals, which is absolutely essential to the science based community. But when I sit back as a farmer, and when I am investing into the research, such as through GRDC, I want to make sure that that's hitting the ground, that I can actually touch and feel some of these things that are coming through, and to then to make sure that they are relevant to actually what will make the difference to my business. And that comes back to things like, what problem are we actually solved? Or what have we actually solved today? What is, what's the next problem that we need to solve on top of that? And once again, frost and heat stress are as important to me as drought, are as important to me as quality. And unfortunately, in most of the crops that I grow, I don't get actually paid on the quality. I've got to hit a parameter to sell it, yes. But then above and beyond that, if I'm, if I'm a gold or a bronze medal winner in this category, it doesn't matter. All I've got to do is get it home. So what can we actually do to make sure that we're getting, uh, where we've defined the problem correctly and we're solving it in the acute manner? And then when it comes back to the technology, everything is supply and demand. The cost of stacked um, a stick technology gene that was presented earlier is 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 going to be more attractive to me because when I'm buying canola seed for roughly two hundred uh, twenty to twenty two thousand dollars per ton, for me to buy that extra gene, for me to buy that extra technology is a very small step versus a single stage technology, and that's a huge investment for when I'm putting in roughly well, can be up to a, a ton of seed a year that I want to make sure I'm getting um, the best return on my investment. So stack genes are really important to me. But when we have those discussions, when we talk with plant breeders, it's actually understanding who, what we're trying to achieve both by the, the technology we're putting in, and then what can I sell it for at the end of the day? Who's going to actually take it up? And that trade is really important. And so we come back to that public acceptance. Who are our heroes? Who are actually promoting this technology? I can grow the best crop in the world and if I can't sell it, it's worth nothing to me. But vice versa, if it's something that the community accepts or something the community wants, it is easier for me as a farmer to make that decision. And when we come back to the cost of developing this technology, the cost of implementation, it does actually fall back to the agricultural community. I have to have faith in what's being presented to me. I have to have faith that I can move this crop. I have to have faith that I can grow this crop. I have to be able to touch and feel it before I actually make that, that leap of faith to say, yes, I'm going to get into a certain crop and a certain investment that I have to do, let alone all the import royalties and levies that I, I incur on the way as well. So I want to make sure that money's getting invested smart. So when we look to the future, um, the, the farmer uh, looking at uh, chemistry or looking at the, the plant itself, how that can help with health is a huge benefit to the selling process. Looking at climate adaptation, making sure that we can address things like that, the, the frost risk, the heat shock, making sure that I'm getting best water use efficiency. And also to the extent of looking at C4 plants versus C3, being able to capture and sequent carbon is now becoming one of the more tradable aspects to my business potentially into the future. So why shouldn't I be looking at biomass as a as an actual value to my business, not, not something that I've got to discard at the end of the cropping cycle. And those efficiencies actually drive my water use. And for me, the soil is my most important asset. The water is my, my biggest driver of my business and the biggest risk I have is making poor decisions. And so when we come back to it, the language that we use and the actions that we take really drive that perception and that reputation that when I sit around my sister's coffee table, I meet her friends, I meet my nephew's friends, those are the discussions that I have. And just to put things in a final slide, just in a bit of perspective, when, when we talk about agriculture, here's my sort of, my, my big things that I've seen in, in, in the time that I've been home on the farm, let alone my family being third generation farmers, it's the mechanisation has made a huge bit. The fact that we've been able to grow more efficient crops, those, those um, dwarf varieties of wheat um, have been amazing. Noting that um, you see Federation being one of the standards of wheat that came through our area in the Olympic, they were massive crops, but you couldn't get any yield out of them. So that's been a huge thing. Soil fertility, pest management, both chemical fertilisers, using integrated pest management, such important aspects to my business. And for me, um, that's core cool for us to actually keeping my cost of production down because we have got a very high cost of production in Australia. I don't have the, 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 the labour that many other countries have that offset my mechanisation, offset my, um, but the other attributes that I, that I have to then um, farm a larger area. And for that, digital farming for me is going to be one of the huge steps that does go hand in glove with any biotech that I do take on because I need to make better decisions. And it shouldn't be underestimated that polypipe is one of the biggest and most important inventions for agriculture. 
the humble poly pipe for me represents something that is so simple but allows me to move water across my whole property very easily and efficiently um, that is something that enables my livestock enterprise to really maximize um, its efficiency itself so when i think about biotech and its potential in many ways, I don't need it to be the Rolls Royce of something. I just need it to be the poly pipe and actually get the job done to get my product from A to B, making sure that I'm doing it in a sustainable way. And most of all, that I've got a good message to sell to my customers at the end of the day, because ultimately I'm in a global marketplace. I have to be competitive in that global marketplace and I can't afford to, first of all, fall behind in my management, but secondly, fall behind in the science that I adopt. So anyway, I'll once again enjoy some questions later at the end of the session, and I thank you for your time. Thank Thanks, David. That uh, certainly a, a fantastic summary of somebody at the coal place of the industry. And the last speaker before we go over to a panel discussion and have a Q and A is uh, Professor Jim Whelan, um, who's going to give us the Australian Biotech research perspective and how we're uh, approaching addressing some of the the issues that David has raised. So, um, so thank you for your time. Um, so I'm just going to give you one perspective on the global status of biotech crops. To some degree, it'll be maybe an Australian perspective, but some degree, obviously, it'll be what a personal perspective, because uh, while I don't like to admit it, I started university in 1982. And it turned out to be a very exciting time because in 1983, was really when the breakthrough in, in transgenic crops came through, when uh, three individual groups, one was Robert Fraley, one was Mary Dale Chilton, and one was Mark von, von Montague and Jeff Shell, really published the uh, first papers on transgenic plants uh, in the literature and all the doing separate systems. It's important to point out that this came from decades of research on crown gall disease, agrobacterium, and the technology that's behind that. If we fast forward to now, and this is just a diagram taken from this article here, we actually can see how sophisticated the system has got. We can really edit the genome in such fine detail that it's actually quite exciting to believe that we can make anything from a single deletion or repair right up onto multiple changes. So we really have a chance to actually change things very precisely. Now, this is very important because we go to this example here that's in the literature and, like, and tomatoes. And, and I think probably most of us anywhere in the world would, would know about tomatoes. And I think there's a common complaint that, you know, tomatoes in the supermarkets or wherever you get them these days don't taste like they used to. Now, I don't really know, but um, because I'm not a big tomato eater. But the important thing here is that with six simple editing steps, you can go from a basically land race of tomato to a refined product. Now, but the really important thing is that through a traditional approach, which would take 50 or maybe more years, that you do it blindly, as well as getting the trait that you might want in terms of disease resistance or increased kind of like being content or whatever, you also may lose things. You may lose taste. You may use beneficial things because you're basically doing it blind. It's like driving down, whereas when you're doing it with editing, you're doing it very precisely right down to that one base pair in billions of bases. So it'd be like driving down a, a freeway at 100 miles an hour. Now, if you're doing it traditional way, you're driving down that freeway blindfolded. But you can see out a tiny little bit. But if you're doing it by gene editing, you've got 20-20 vision. So which way would you want to be doing it? And this goes back to, I think Paul showed a a map something like this. And the question I would have here on this slide would be is, how many billion meals have they been consumed with GM products and no adverse cases reported? Now, this is a very important point because as I think as the previous speaker said that a lot of people question, oh, like, well, is it safe? Is it good? Is it all these things? But imagine if you had several billion biological reps on any other biological process or any process. Now, I'm not gonna make any simple comparisons because I don't want to be seen to be negative about other areas in science, but you know, various political parties might say, oh, like, you know, this isn't this or this isn't that, but you have to accept other science. And you can't take one branch of science and accept it and not take another branch of science and don't accept it. So this, this decisions really need to be not 
based on kind of like what you feel or what you believe. They actually have to be based on the science. And the science is that GM is very safe. It's actually incredibly safe compared to lots of other things out there. And that's not to say that lots of other scientific things are not quite good as well. And that really we have to look at why do we actually get the pushback from certain things? Why are people choosing not to accept this, but then accept other things? So I think this is a very important point. And Paul also had this point here. Now, I'll go through the individual things in a minute, but I think the important thing is here is that it's often pointed out, or it's sometimes mistakenly pointed out a lot, that it's big biotech companies that are benefiting from this. But I would point out that it's individual farmers. 17 million farmers are not a biotech company. They're actually people who are trying to make a living, who are trying to actually better their lives and things like that. So they are, they are individual people. That if you actually have a better environment, that's a benefit to everybody, not just a biotech company. You're reducing CO2 emissions, which I think it's widely agreed that climate change is the biggest problem facing the world in the long term. You can serve biodiversity because you're not using more chemicals and things like that. You're not getting drift from agricultural land into, into uh, parks and things like that. And you would get increased production. At the moment, for traditional crops, we often have to put more into it just to maintain yield. Whereas with biotech crops, we're getting more with the same input. So we're actually increasing productivity. So these benefits really need to be stacked up against what actually is out there at the moment. And they're of benefit to lots of people, not companies. That's really important to note. Now, this is a, an, an old analysis from an article to bring it back to the Australian perspective from crop life. And it's just looking at the increase in farm income, whether it be canola or cotton and things like that. And you can see the increase per hectare and things like that. Again, this is important for regional communities in Australia. Now, so, I'm not going to read through all this point here, but there's a, there's a few things that are very important. First of all, farmers work in regional communities and the sustainability of not just the farm, but of the regional communities depend on farmers being sustainable and their income and things like that. So every time a farmer actually goes out of business or can't make a profit, it not only affects the individual, it affects the whole community. Okay, there's increased productivity. This is very important in a world that we're losing land, arable land, every day to salinity, climate change, drought, and other things. Okay, we, we reduce the amount of chemicals that we put in, in the environment. Now, this again is very important because both studies in Australia and I'm sure elsewhere show that by not applying the chemicals, not only are you not putting the chemicals on the crop, you're not getting any drift into neighboring kind of national parks. So you actually, you've increased biodiversity uh, by, by actually using GM crops. And also even with the amount of fuel that you're not using to put those chemicals on again and again and again, you reduce CO2 emissions. So there's benefits to the whole of society from actually apply, uh, from using GM crops. So, and I'll just finish up on this. This is an article. This is from an article that was published recently on the ISA report. And it was pointing out like, you know, that it was a very good report, but that also is about the inequity of biotechnology impact. That I think as Tony said at the start, 2 billion people face food insecurity. And almost 30% of children under five actually have some sort of growth defect because of malnutrition. But yet, Less than 1% of the total population of the developing world is positively impacted by biological innovation because of the pushback on it. The cost of getting crops to actually market, a biotech crop to market, $150 million. And we're asking developing countries that have, are poor and like to try to actually cover these costs. The amount of income that would be lost by low and middle income nations by 2015 will be over $1.5 trillion if they're actually not allowed to go forward with these technologies. So I will actually kind of make the point is that one of the UN sustainable goals is food security and biosecurity and equal societies. Now, I would make the point is that feeding the world is not a scientific problem anymore. It's a regulatory problem. And it's actually very important that we actually, uh, we actually now address this regulatory problem to actually ensure that we can actually get the advantages of this technology. So I'll just thank you for your time. And I'm sure we'll all try to answer any questions people may have.
Thanks, Jim. Much appreciated. We're going to, now going to move to a panel discussion. But before we do so, I'd like to introduce a couple of other members who will be on the panel. Uh, Maha Harijanan. Maha is the Global Coordinator for ISAAA and she's the Executive Director of the Malaysian Biotechnology Information Centre. She is the founder and editor-in-chief of the Petri Dish and co-founder of Science Media Centre Malaysia and an international consultant for the UN FAO Biosafety Project in Sri Lanka. She's an adjunct lecturer at Monash University in Malaysia and part of the university. She has a PhD in science communication from the University of Malaya and is a renowned science communicator in the agri-biotech field and was listed as the world's 100 most influential people in biotech by Scientific American worldwide in 2015. The other member of the panel is uh, Professor Marilyn Anderson, who's from the La Trobe Institute for Ag and Food. Marilyn has over 40 years experience in scientific research in the area of plant biochemistry and genetics. She holds the positions of Professor of Biochemistry at La Trobe University. She's also the Chief Scientific Officer and Director of Hexima, one of the early and still um, viable biotech company, plant biotech companies in Australia. And she was a founding scientist and director. And she's actively engaged in the R&D of plant-derived proteins and peptides for the applications of human therapeutics. Uh, Marilyn is also a CI in the Australian Research Centre Council's uh, Industry Transformation Research Hub for Medicinal Agriculture and a fellow of our academy in Australia, uh, both the Academy of Sciences and Technological Academy of Sciences. The other member is Ola Romero Aldemita. And Ola is also from ISAAA and she holds a PhD in botany from Purdue in Indiana and has postdoc fellowships at the Albert Ludwigs University in Freiburg, Germany. She obtained her undergraduate at the University of the Philippines in Los Banos and she leads the development and publications of ISAAA's annual global status of commercial Lies biotech and GM crops, coordinates capacity building and biotechnology and biosafety activities in ISA's biotechnology information centres, and she is a leading scientist lecturer in ag biotech in the Philippines and the region. So with that, um, we'll throw open to the panel discussion and address some of the questions that uh, have appeared. And I So perhaps I can start by asking Marilyn to comment on uh, seeing we finished uh, on that note with Jim talking about the regulatory environment and whether she'd comment on the regulatory environment in Australia for agricultural products and for food and how that addresses the safety uh, and health concerns that many people have about biotech foods. Thank you, Tony. And, uh... Welcome everyone to this webinar. So uh, gene technology is really tightly regulated worldwide. And actually in Australia, we were leaders in getting regulations up and going quite early. Uh, so in Australia, gene technology is regulated by the Officer, Office of the Gene Technology Regulator, which is within the Department of Health. And they work under the Gene Technology Act, which was started in two, which was uh, established in 2000. They focus on three things uh, so that any genetically modified organism in Australia should not uh, affect human health or adversely, should not, should not, uh, should be safe and it should not affect the environment. That's entirely what the regulator uh, operates on. They have some strict guidelines and regulations that everyone has to adhere to if they work in this industry. So it starts at the universities or the people who do the research. Uh, so the type of facilities they use uh, and the type of research that they're allowed to do. Uh, this, this office also handles uh, requests for permission to release any organisms into the environment. And they also would administer any penalties to anybody who doesn't obey the regulations. 
once once a gene uh, 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 an organism has is uh, past the early developmental stages then it goes through three more regulatory agencies one is food standards australia for food then the australian pesticides and veterinary medicines authority if it's a pesticide or a um, and the therapeutic goods administration if it's uh, a therapeutic now all countries have very strict guidelines and so if you produce a genetically modified food in Australia, you would not be able to export it to another country unless it's passed also passed their regulations. And that means that some of these crops that we're talking about, uh, like corn, the only way that it can be exported around the world is if various countries independently through their own regulatory agencies approve that genetically modified food. And you will have seen the same with the COVID vaccine as every country is separately going through their own approval processes. Mm -hmm. Very tightly regulated and very expensive. And as Jim says, it may cost up to $136 million to get a product all the way from discovery out to the market, if you're lucky. And I would say that over $100 million of that would be regulatory expenses. So Marilyn, there's two questions which we can address to you while you're on there. One is, what about plant breeding innovations and that avenue for getting GM crops to market? And the other was, how long does it usually take to get approval of a, of a trait? Approval of a trait, I can answer that more quickly, will often take probably up to 10 years. There are many uh, experiments and field trials that you need to do tests on animals to ensure that the product is entirely safe and that there is absolutely no change in that product. Great uh, deal of attention on, even before people start on potential allergenicity or toxicity. So that's very extensive, takes a long time. Uh, the other question, Tony, was... Well, about the avenue of plant breeding innovations and whether that's a faster way to go through plant breeding. I presume plant variety rights is what they're asking the question about with the AGTR currently reviewing that legislation. Yes, you may know more about that. Uh, so uh, it still would be subject to plant variety rights once you had developed a plant. Uh, so... Uh, that I haven't followed a lot. You may know the answer to that more than me. No, I'm not. But I think that let's, uh, I, I don't know how that, but I would presume before, I mean, you'd have to go through the regulatory safety issues about a, a GM event, but then you also, whoever the company is that wants to market it would have to get the would have to get protection as well through. I the... should probably add that if you're a scientist and you have a new trait, uh, you develop that technology, but there's also a whole lot of separate technology as to who owns the elite germplasm in which you put that trait. So that wouldn't belong to the scientists. That's why a lot of this technology is left in the hands of the big agri biotechnology companies because they own the valuable germplasm that is protected by plant variety rights and that there's extensive work done to make sure that introduction of the gene, uh, your trait, does not in any way impact on yield. Because David is correct. Uh, any, uh, any genetically modified crop will be rejected, no matter what the trait is, if it has more than a 5% impact on yield. Yield is king. So, David, I just wondered whether you wanted to comment because there was a question there about the price differential you would get for a, for a crop that's uh, that's GM versus non-biotech. Thanks, Tony. That's a that's always a bit of a hard piece of string to measure. Um, however, like if you can re reduce the, the 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 amount of inputs that I've got to to control a certain weed or a pest, could be up to fifty dollars a hectare. But then it's the advantage of it not. Um, taking any of my potential away. So by the time I see that uh, either that pest disease or or plant that I need to manage, it's already taken some potential out of that crop. So getting on to that, that early could be a 15% could be um, increase in yield, purely because I, so something I don't need to manage at that time. 
So once again, when we talk about stack genes, it is about making sure that I'm getting a benefit out of that. But if I can't sell that product at the end of the day, it's, it's zero to me anyway. But um, the economics of growing um, anything that is uh, has got some biotech in it, it needs to stack up as far as the conventionals go. And when we look at products such as wheat that was mentioned earlier, um, I know that the political will for that is as much of an issue as, as the actual technology that is available to that, that, uh, that crop variety. And it's that acceptance that um, the benefits that it can potentially give both the industry, the ag farming community, and then the broader community is one of the real, real probably tough nuts that we've got to, to be challenged with in the next decade. Thanks, Dave. Jim, maybe you'd like to comment on how the technologies advanced or shortened the time frame between the bench and, and getting a trait that could potentially be tested in the field. How, how much of a difference has that made to, to the identification of traits? Um, well, I, I think the reason is, I think what it's shortened it considerably because the reason being is now you can be very precise with the modification you make. So therefore, rather than trying to take, like, you know, get, get two varieties and cross them and then breed the beneficial trait into another, which can take several rounds of backcrossing in years, you can actually do it instantly. And importantly, you're not losing well, what they call the unknown unknowns. Like, I mean, when we started breeding crops 5,000 years ago, we didn't know that 5,000 years later, we'd need resistance to this fungus. So we didn't like, you know, keep those things. So therefore we've lost a lot of the, like, you know, we've lost a lot of that diversity. We've lost a lot of those things in breeding programs. Now, that's not a criticism of the traditional approaches. They have been very good, but really this technology allows us now to go back to the land races and really go back and redo all that again, but in a very precise manner, while we maintain a lot of you maybe uh, extra benefits like nutritional quality, disease resistance, and other things like that. So like the example I gave was from Tomato, they did it with six editing events, which can be literally now with, a, with the prime editing technology that can be done in a single transformation. So that, like, you know, that really is kind of quite powerful. And the other thing that would be very important there is for developing countries or even in developed countries, we could actually do it for crops that we haven't traditionally used rather than kind of like having to go back through decades of breeding, we could apply it instantly. So therefore we get to try those, a lot of different crops very fast. So I think that's got kind of, you know, again, would put diversity in the agriculture and would maybe make us more resilient if we actually had what you might call a plant COVID coming along that hits out a major crop and things like that. Thanks, Jim. Maha, perhaps you could comment on a question that's come through about China and has it shown any great interest or investment in biotech crops and is China the next big producer worldwide? Tony, I think I will pass that question to Ola. She will okay. be a better person to uh, answer that. If she's uh, Yes, thank you so much. Actually, there are several, there are three questions I need to answer at this time because there were questions about China. China is actually the number two country in Asia producing by the crops and it's cotton and papaya. The PRSB papaya ring spot virus resistant papaya. And it was shown in Paul's presentation that it is number, uh, let me see that. It was in the top 10 countries planting by the crops. So currently there was a release last week that China is rebuilding up, rebuilding again. It's a, a biotechnology program. So it will be continue. Uh, it's not continuing, but it's going to be revamped or uh, streamlined so that there will be more crops, more biotech crops to be approved and uh, provided to the farmers. And then the second question was uh, on Europe, what's happening in Europe? So currently we have two countries, Plantain Biotech Maize. This is uh, Mon810 BT corn, and it is in Spain and Portugal. It, they have been planting it since 2002. And uh, before we had around 10 countries planting in Europe, but then because of the differences in opinions and political uh, opinions there, uh, two countries uh, remained. These are Spain and Portugal. 
And also there's a question on um, Kenya is currently growing BT con, cotton. That's, that's not uh, included in our 2019 data as yet because uh, they have started planting in 2020. So the, we will be putting Kenya in the 2020 data. And also, uh, yeah, we have six countries in Africa now. And uh, it is very good that um, Africa, which was the, we say the last frontier, but they have been uh, revitalizing the regulatory system. And now we have six countries. And when we report the 2020, we will have seven countries, which will now be including Kenya. Thank you. Thanks, Ola. I think also to add to the China discussion is that we're aware that actually China is developing GM I mean, a lot of GM crops, for example, in yes. rice, they, they are actively testing them in a controlled environment. They're not approved for food use yet, but they have many of their major crops that they've actually developed GM traits for and that they're ready to roll out. And it's just a decision as to when to proceed. I'll, uh, I just um, wondered whether, uh, Maha, sorry, whether I could ask you about a communications issue and... Yes is that what can the agri-food sector learn from the biomedical sector where these GM biotech technologies are accepted as vital to the production of our novel drugs and vaccines, the COVID vaccines, as we've just found out, that came into play within 12 months. And yet we still have consumer suspicion around foods, but not around medicines. You want to uh, address how you see that as a <laughs> challenge from a communications point of view, or yeah, sure. Thank you, thank you, Tony. You know the thing with uh, science communication, there's no one single answer. There's no one simple answer. But I would say the difference between medical biotechnology or any medical technologies and agriculture is in medical biotechnology we are not given so many options. Insulin, for example, we don't have another insulin produced through another technology. It's recombinant protein. But in agribiotechnology, we've got so many options. Plus, the underlying factor is also food is very close to our heart, our culture and sentiments, emotions. So when people go and buy food, they will see nature's wonder, uh, farm fresh, so, you know, these are the words that sort of resonates with them. Uh, food from the countryside, fruit um, uh, from the back, you know, cottage industry. So these are the challenges that we face when we bring in all these new technologies. So I think we have to like, that is why as a science communicator, I always say go into the storytelling mode of even if it is genetically modified, it is produced by a farmer like David in um, the countryside. It's not coming from the factory and genetic modification itself is not new. But I would also urge scientists to use this opportunity, this COVID vaccine um, opportunity, mRNA technology, and say that you know, these technologies have been there and it is not new and we need it and how it is saving life. So, um, as I said, there's no one answer, but, um, but then the sentiments of people is different when they approach medical and food, because medical is always between life and death. Whether if I'm really very bad uh, a di a diabetic patient, I have to take it or I don't take it and I suffer. But in food is I've got so many options. So this is where scientists have to really come together and you know, not only scientists, farmers and all the other uh, communicators have to come together and weave our information together so that it resonates with the public. Thanks, Ma. I saw a question and I know David's partly answered it too, but Jim, there's a question about why, what's going on with vertical farming and, <clears throat> and controlled growth in, in controlled growth environments indoor about enhancing nutrition and, and uh, you know, what, is there anything in that space that's developed? Yes. Yes, I think that is also science communication in it. I saw David um, uh, gave some answers. Now, the thing is, I think the public and other stakeholders, including policymakers, must understand that in agriculture, with all the uh, challenges that we are facing, global cha uh, um, uh, food security, 
um, climate change and uh, restric uh, restricted resources, with all these things that we are facing, there's no one solution that will address all these problems. So we need urban farming. That is why ISA is pro-choice. We want urban, urban farming. We want indoor farming. Uh, we want traditional biotechnology. We want organic. And also we want this modern biotechnology, genetic uh, modification and new breeding technologies. So imagine urban farming is not as simple as, you know, we, we need all the infrastructure the uh, the 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 building itself and the water system the fertilization for the fertilizers to to go through so we need all these things and imagine in a country which is really poor somewhere in remote africa you know they can't build this they're still traditional farmers so if we can give them better seed which is drought tolerant saline uh, tolerant so you know this also helps so we need all technologies that's my answer to that question Jim, did you want to comment too? Thanks, Maha. Yeah, I would comment is that I would go back to the point about that I think uh, that was made by the previous speaker is that uh, maybe people like David have been too, like, and when I say too successful, I don't mean, but they're too good at what to do because they do consistently come up with good quality food and in, in, in what we'd say in lots of countries, now not all countries, Food is relatively cheap. If you look at the cost of food now, we'd say, say in the European context, that might be seen as anti-GM. Uh, mm -hmm. You look at the cost of food now for an average family person and the proportion of their income it takes compared to 100 years ago, it's tiny. They're now spending more on shelter and their, their new car and whatever. They're changing their, their phone every year than they would be on food. Whereas 100 years ago, 50 to 70% of their income might be going on food and then only the rest on shelter. So first of all, we need to acknowledge, um, I'd agree with, I, I think David Swann is very good. We actually do, like, you know, I don't think, we do need heroes and farmers, but maybe they are heroes, but we just haven't recognized it. So that's what gives people the choice. And I think then we need to kind of say, well, that's fine if we have that choice, but we should make that choice for everybody else in the world because for the 2 billion people that don't have food security and that need this technology, we shouldn't be in the position, well, I don't need it, so I don't care. So that's what I would say that goes on there. And while, again, I think it's great if people want to do any sort of farming they want, whether it be vertical farming but, or whether it be um, uh, organic, at the end of the day, none of those technologies in their current forms and costs will actually feed 9 billion people. It's, I mean, if you look at the history of farming, it was the industrial revolution and the mechanization of farms that allowed the growth in the population, the, like, and things like that. And we really need that, that farming still. Whereas, so vertical farming, while it's good, is very expensive and it's not feasible for the majority of the people on the planet because they just don't have access to the technology, the power and things like that. So really this technology is what it's needed and also for the environment, I would say, like, I mean, so that's what I would say about that point. Thanks, Jim. I saw David nodding wildly there. I thought maybe you wanted to comment as well around that front. Oh, I think Jim nailed it. Look, at the end of the day, it comes down to cost of production. There's, there's ideals in agriculture, there's ideals in food production, but at the end of the day, when you're standing at the supermarket and you're looking at caged eggs or free range, if you don't have the capacity to, to buy your ideals, you're going to go to where the money is. And that's mm. where agriculture has a role to play in that space. Now, I'm not going to debate if it's right or wrong, but the reality is um, people have to eat. People have to have to spend. They've got other priorities in their lives as well. So uh, I think it's a great thing that we should be investigating, but I can't ever see it over, overtaking commercial agriculture in the short or, mid, or even long term. Yeah, it has to be a very high value uh, commodity in order to be um, that way. Marilyn, you were going to comment too, I think. Yes, I wanted to address the, the discussion on vertical farming. It depends where you are. If you're interested in vertical farming, have a look at Singapore. They've, mm. uh, they, their government has decided that they need to be self-sustainable. They don't have the big land mass that we have here and they are investing heavily in vertical farming. So again, it depends on where you are. Thanks, Marilyn. I think uh, we also had a, we've, I think we've well addressed that one. We've also had a question about animal biotech and I think Kim is wanting to answer that one. Kim? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Same, okay. Doesn't seem like we can reach Kim at the moment. Oh, yes. No, I think David's probably the best one for that, actually. Ah. Animal biotech. David, do you know anything in that space in terms of Australian? Oh, look, I know, I, I know we've been playing around. And to be honest, as a farmer, this is, this is the honest truth here. As a farmer, I can buy the best genetics for a sheep, for a cattle, but if I don't feed it right, you know, it's, it's worthless to me. So I, I'm actually better to buy commercial grade genetics and put better nutrition through them. And that's going to give me a better result than if I go high, high genetics and low nutrition, if that's my choice between the two. Now, that's a, in some ways, people can say that's a very short-sighted view because you, you invest in genetics. Yeah, you do. But if I don't invest in my nutrition, uh, my animal is no good to me. However, saying that, I do believe in our lifetime we'll see some huge advantages in animal breeding techniques and, and very much like what Jim presented in his presentation around how we actually use genetic technology to, to get that breeding to a stage where we're getting more desirable traits, where we, we can see um, better outcomes through, um, I know it's noted in animal welfare, but at the end of the day, if a sow has 12 piglets, um, a sow rolling over on their piglets without a, a, a farrowing cage is is a public, um, it's a public question of, of what we what we would like to see animals used for. That's going to have a, a, as much an effect as as how quickly they grow out. So, um, for me, I, I guess we're at the we're at the discussion of having um, closer communications with consumers um, so that they understand why and how we do what we do as much as their public acceptance of what we do as well. And, and noting that um, the fake meat movement. Um, is a very interesting discussion prior to COVID. You don't hear probably as much of it post or in the middle of COVID, but um, I do believe that that plant-based based, um, uh, nutrition is something that uh, that we'll see more of. And as a as a lentil and chickpea producer, um, I don't discourage it either. Thanks, David. I think um, we've also had some questions in the background about where the biotech jobs are and what sort of training there is and maybe David to start with and then we'll tip it to the others but what sort of skill sets do you think farmers need and the regions need in order to uh, survive? Innovation. You've got to adapt. You've got to, you've got to take the challenge on. So whoever asked that question, as I said, just take a snapshot of everyone in the attendee list, look them up on LinkedIn, show some initiative because at the end of the day, it's how, how you actually embrace the problem, not to sit there back and admire the problem. It's actually what you do about it. It's the difference between if we're going to survive or not as the community that we're currently growing in. So use your initiative, have a crack. There's, there's, there is plenty of opportunity. It's actually one of the going to be a cornerstone for agriculture biotech. It's absolutely going to be cornerstone for us. But um, it's really, it's up to you to make the, the step. It's not going to come to you. Tony, can I answer uh, a bit more about the animal biotechnology? Sure. Yes. So I know that uh, in Australia, we al you already have something going on with Paul Dairy Cows. And I guess uh, this is one of the things that could be coming soon. You know, we are uh, improving animals not only for use for human food, for human consumption, but also for their welfare, especially for disease resistance. And uh, yeah, this is one of those animals, uh, the Paul Dairy Cows, that can be considered and hopefully it would be in Australia soon. Thanks, yeah. no, 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 Sorry, Tony, noting too that we use sex semen, as, as that's, that's probably the bigger advantage at the moment for the dairy industry is actually sex semen and how we utilize wow. um, bobby calves, because at the end of the day, the welfare issue of what we do with male bulls is a bigger issue than actually if they've got horns on them and not for longer term prospects. So. Once again, um, and it was mentioned earlier, the animal welfare or the community expectations on agriculture is, is it heightened and we have to make sure that we are responding to that in a responsible way. Okay. And, and I think just back to the education issue, I think the um, universities and the teaching environment needs to change from delivering very traditional ag-based courses that many of us were trained with where it was a very different uh, exposure than happens today. And today, modern agriculture requires a whole suite of skills, including digital and computational and bioinformatics. And so there's many 
in fact, small businesses that are opening up in the regional areas that would traditionally not have been seen as agribusinesses. But it's, so I think you've got to look at the full gamut. There's climate that's important so you can get jobs there, soils and nutrition. So every aspect of agriculture now needs that multidisciplinary skill set, including the farmers. So I think we've got to stand up to the plate to deliver courses that are contemporary and cover these areas. I think we're getting closer towards a closing remarks, but I just wondered whether each of the panel members wanted to make a final comment before we go to closing comments by Maha. Uh, there's one question that is still here on the board. Uh, what are the biggest limitations that are hold, holding black, back biotech crops from being developed and released? Maybe uh, each one of us can respond to this and may I start that one of those would be the acceptance, of course, by the public uh, for consumption and for adoption. And also there are some countries who are, which are still not having a good regulatory framework. So we'll have to help these countries because this will um, hinder development and commercialization of by the crops. Maybe some other panelists can also say something about this. What would be the uh, hindering issues about this? Thanks, Ola. Um, Jim, do you, would you like to answer that? And also there's a question coming about CRISPR technology and how it's shaping GM crops and what role it has to play. Okay, well, so the first one, I, I would say, yeah. I mean, I think we need leadership on it from our political parties. I mean, yes. they're able to show leadership on other things uh, when, when they want to. And I think they need to show some leadership on this based on science. I don't, it's not a question of, oh, yes, let's do it on controls. Nobody is saying that. But I think we actually have to kind of put the science there out with everything else. Like, you know, again, as I say, I, I don't want to make comparisons to COVID and other things like that, because I think it's important people have confidence in that. But we don't have billions of individual cases where people have taken like so, um, and no adverse conditions. So really, you know, as a scientist, I would never say anything is absolutely proved, but I think we're well beyond any reasonable doubt. And parties that deny that really need to be asked why they're anti-science. They really need to be confronted. And while I applaud everybody that's doing all the education on this, and they have been doing it back since 1982 and three, I think really it now comes to, I won't say we, like, you know, we need to kind of say, why are you anti-science on this matter? Would you accept it on everything else? So I think we need to cut, like, you know, confront it in a respectful manner, but confront it because otherwise we're not going to get that leadership. So that's where I would say we're on that. We actually need, we need a sensible, informed debate on it. And like, you know, to use a, a, an old term that I hope goes out very fast, like the person who used to use it, fake facts. There's no such thing as fake fact. A fact is a fact. A fake is okay? a fake. And that's it. So, and, and like, you know, so, and as for CRISPR, uh, the technology, I think, it's, I think it's really important because, again, it gives you that precision. In fairness, that, I mean, back in 1983, when these things were done, there would have been multiple rearrangements of the genome. There'd been multiple things going in. So it actually could cause, you know, some things to go on, but not, not maybe not to the extent. You know, so you have to look at it. But now with genome sequencing technology and the precision we have, we can actually say exactly what's been done to that genome down to the base pair level. So that is the first guarantee you can actually give. And again, that's documented, that can be lodged, that is, can be transparent to anyone who wants to consume this. And secondly, along with CRISPR, we have a lot of the technologies in the recombination to remove the selectable markers. So like, you know, the plants aren't antibiotic resistant or whatever for the transformation marker. So it takes that fear out of it that the plants will be spelling, you know, spreading genes for antibiotic resistance, which can impact other things, which there's absolutely no evidence that ever happened, but it was actually out there. But with these technologies that call terminator technologies, with CRISPR, it really allows us to know exactly what goes on. Thanks, Jim. Marilyn, as somebody who's taken a discovery through to a product in a biotech company, what do you have to say as a concluding comment? Look, I'd go back to the cost and the time that it takes and that uh, 
most investors nowadays don't want this, these long-term projects. Unfortunately, it is only the big companies that can afford to take products through to market. And uh, so I think there are a lot of opportunities, but it's just very expensive. And uh, I, I think single, single small countries like Australia really can't afford a lot of this work. I like the, the you know, the, the gene mapping for animals and so forth. That gives a more immediate sort of response. But taking a product all the way through to market, that's, that's very expensive. So you'd say the regulatory costs are prohibitive at the moment too? For well, we all know that the same goes for a pharmaceutical. We have to look after human health and the environment and uh, that's, that's first. So this technology will develop slowly unless of course there's an immediate need. And I do think that climate change is going to put such pressure on the human population and problems of feeding people that, that there'll be more pressure put on moving these things through the market. Because in reality, we've talked a lot about the opportunities, but in reality, there's only two traits that are really out there. That's insect protection and herbicide mm -hmm. resistance. The others are small, they're not, a ma they're not major commercial projects mm -hmm. yet. Thanks, Marilyn. And perhaps the person at the coalface, David, is the last word there, and then we'll hand over to Maha to close. Uh, I, I agree with leadership. Um, when we talk about this technology, um, we're dealing with, you know, neutrons, protons, electrons and morons. <laughs> and unfortunately, when we talk about public perception, um, we don't we don't have leaders that are willing to, to put their hand up and say, actually, that's that's incorrect. The, the, the real science is A or B or C. And the reason why we believe in science is because we're actually living in a civilization built on science. And I, I fear that, and it was mentioned too about the research funding cycles. When, we, when, when it's based on a three or five year cycle, you, you can't get anything done. And when we've got politics based, politics views, I should say, based on that as well, we don't have any vision. We don't have any commitment to that vision. And that, I feel, for us as a country, we can't afford to be squandering or, or bickering between ourselves because the game's much bigger for us. Climate change can decimate our food production and the export advantage that we have now. Don't, let, don't, don't, don't be mistaken by that. And that's our, one of our greatest challenges of our time. And when we've got politicians that want to argue the toss um, if their constituents will vote for them or not because of, of what they perceive to be a, a winnable seat. Um, I just fear that our, our politics is going to be slipping to that fourth um, dimension more than, more than us focusing on the real game. So for me, it is about leadership. For me, it is about standing up for what's right and um, having, having people with the gumption, those heroes or leaders, whichever way you want to phrase it, those people to actually take the mantle and, and hold steadfast to the cause. And that is we, the amount of people who consume food around the world and are not poisoned from, from Australian produce. We, we, we are great producers, but um, we also have to we can't rest on our laurels. We've got to make sure we're sustainable. We've got to make sure that our cost of production is managed. But most of all, it, and I mentioned it earlier too, it doesn't matter on the management or the techniques we have, they can always be copied. The key thing is that we're pushing forward and making sure we're looking to that light on that hill, that vision where we can um, be adopting the best techniques, the best um, uh, technology um, within the agricultural community to, to ensure that we are um, you know, best in class, at least pushing somewhere near the top. We don't have to be the ones taking the product full, full, fully through to commercialisation, but we need to be at the table to get access to that technology. Thanks, David. I think a great retort too to the fake news. I like that quote. Uh, I think with that, uh, we should get Maha to provide closing comments on this. Thanks, Maha. Thank you, Tony. I think um, what, uh, David did a very good summary, actually. I always believed that farmers are our best communicators. Uh, so with that, thank you so much to Liaf, actually, and uh, Latrop for allowing, you know, for hosting this um, 
AISA's webinar on global status of biotech crops. In fact, this is the first time AISA is doing this, launching our status, uh, our report in Australia and Oceania, and we're very happy to do that. So because we are not, we have not really collaborated much, a lot with Australia, New Zealand, the Oceania, I would like to just give a very brief uh, summary of AISA and our way forward. So AISA is a pioneer in knowledge transfer on agribiotechnology and with almost three decades of history in Asia and Africa and very successful accomplishments. We have supported many countries in adopting agribiotechnology and we are moving now to gene editing as well. So we facilitated approval adoption and supported resource poor farmers and elevation of, um, alleviation of poverty, increased a public awareness on agribiotechnology. We're talking about that. And as what Ola said, the capacity building in biosafety, where many countries are not capable of developing their regu uh, re regulatory system and also do risk assessment, risk management. Now, AISA is by, uh, it's completely non-partisan uh, and we, we are independent. We are uh, for credible information and we are also pro-choice. That is why I said we want all technology, all the uh, technology to be in the toolkits of breeders, farmers and scientists. We've got two strong centers in Southeast Asia, the center that Ola leads in the Philippines and my um, the other colleague, Dr. Margaret Karembu in Africa. And we're now expanding to the Arab world and Latin America. Now we think really we need to do so much more. Uh, see, even with 20 years or almost 30 years of GM crops being there, we still face a lot of uh, issues. And I would say, as a science communicator, we will be fooling ourselves if we think gene editing will not have any problems just because in some countries it is not um, transgenic. Now, I don't think so. There will be, you know, people are already cooking up things against gene editing. So we still need a lot of initiatives. David nicely said this, the post-truth, the post-trust, um, you know, the proton, electron, and I don't want to continue. But this is the this is the era we are living in as you know the the advancement in biotechnology in sciences is just so rapid but still we are living in post truth post trust post era uh, where people are still dismissing science look at covid for example the vaccination uh, vaccines why is there so much of hesitancy uh, in spite of the science education and all the education that we go through. So science and technology is still difficult for public to follow the developments. These are the concerns and this is why we need more awareness programs and engagement. So AISA, after our three decades of successful uh, Im uh, impact that we have created, we are now moving towards a consortium. So we are calling ourselves Biotrust Consortium, which will be anchored by AISA, but we are going to be branding ourselves as a consortium, Biotrust, uh, to remove ignorance and fear, to build trust and transparency, and to obtain social licensing. This is what David said in the, in the beginning. He said the public acceptance. So this is social licensing. We get our approvals from the regulatory agencies, OGTR in Australia, other regulatory agencies around the world, but the final approval actually comes from the people. And that is why the, the answer, the question from someone on Europe, what's happening in Europe? Europe actually approves, but then it's not adopted. So this is where the social licensing come from. So we want to um, address all these things. So purpose statement is to improve uh, society's acceptance of novel food and new systems through biotechnology um, and uh, by building activities. Our vision is we envision a world where sciences contribute to everyday uh, prosperity, societal well being, and sustainability. For very long, all this agri biotechnology has been labeled as making money for the rich countries, making money for the MNCs, but today we want to show that this is for well being, societal well being, for public good. So that is the direction we want to take. So what are we going to look at? We are not just going to look at crop biotechnology, GM crops, but still we're going to have a wider scope so to support society, uh, sustainable food production and socioeconomic growth. So that will include gene editing, synthetic biology, gene drive, use of biomass. So how can biomass be used to produce fine chemicals and add value added chemicals? We are moving from crop to, live, uh, to uh, animal, livestock, poultry, aquaculture, uh, during the lockdown last year, we organized a series of animal biotechnology webinar where in total we had 60,000 participants attending from 97 countries. 
We are going to go into microbial technologies, precision uh, fermentation, novel food, plant-based meat. But I don't think farmers like David have to have uh, have to worry about meat being produced in the lab because we still need cow and cattles and others for many other industry. And as I said, not one technology can feed the world. So it's it's still going to be there. All this industry is still going to be there. We are just going to have additional uh, new new sectors. So how do we do this? I think this answers a lot of questions on public acceptance. We need to have inclusive engagement strategies. So we want to reach out to all stakeholders in the food systems, farmers, policymakers, regulators, investors, uh, traders, millers, uh, manufacturers, developers, so the entire stakeholder. We want to facilitate social licensing. We have been dealing with regulators. We are going to continue with that, but we are going to go more into grassroots consumer acceptance. Uh, and this is where social media becomes very important. We are going to have uh, support social justice to access to technology. So the technology has to be inclusive. It's not just for certain countries which are able to do it, but even other countries which lack, um, capac which lack capacity, uh, facilities and uh, expertise. So we want to include all countries. And we also, chose, um, social justice meaning we also want to include youth and women especially. There was one question on um, other jobs for graduates. I think this is where we need to support the, uh, the technology so that the graduates that we train can get into the, can get, in, there is a market for them. I am, I have one of my foot in the academic line. I'm an adjunct lecturer in Monash University. So what do we do with the hundreds of uh, graduates that we produce in biosciences? We can only create a market for them if our regulation is enabling, if our policy is enabling. So we need to support new technology, but of course, take you know, responsible science. We want to ensure uh, transparent knowledge sharing, so non-partisan knowledge sharing, in being independent, being factual, and we want to move into future, uh, future proving the society so that the acceptance is built for the novel foods and also the other biosciences. So this is what we intend to do under Biotrust Consortium. Biotrust Consortium now, ISA, is one of the um, not-for-profit organization in this space with the biggest followers. We have got, uh, the, the latest is actually 193,000 followers, subscribers in all our platforms. Uh, as I said, two regional centers, 15 country chapters. One of it is in Malaysia. Uh, we have got experience, network, uh, and expertise that we have built uh, uh, in three decades. Uh, we have got, uh, the, we have built our credibility among global stakeholders. And um, as I said, Asia, Africa, we are going moving into Arab, Latin America, and also Europe. So the consortium itself, we are inviting partners, any partners uh, to join as members. So uh, we're still working on how these membership tiers can be built, but maybe core members where, uh, so, uh, where we can be given some funding to run the secretariat and the technical team. And then we can have supporting members we have uh, where, again, there's some support and that supports our operational cost and also knowledge partners. Now, these are partners with knowledge expertise who can be our resource person and can contribute to building the, uh, the body of knowledge. So that is what we are looking at doing. So please talk to us. That's my email address, how we can achieve our common mutual goals. So thank you very much. And thank you to Latrop and, um, and Liam and also the participants. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Maha. And just in closing, can I commend ISA for the reports that they've been producing for the last 25 years and demonstrating the facts uh, of the biotech GM crop uh, revolution that's been occurring and also for uh, selecting the La Trobe Institute for Agriculture and Food to host this event. I think it's uh, certainly been a very and it's pleasing to see that ISA is now going to move to that area that's come up right throughout this uh, conversation in terms of getting consumer acceptance and the benefits that flow from this. So Biotrust Consortium, I think, is a tremendous uh, development that's moving on from the ISA brand, which is a worldwide brand. So in closing, can I thank all the panel members and the speakers for a very informative conversation. And I think that... Um, it's been informative, it's been provocative, and I think that uh, we're starting to have that co public conversation that's needed from all parts of the, of the value chain, right through from the researchers, the, the farmers, 
and ultimately the consumers and the public and hopefully we can also engage the politicians. So this will be available on various uh, lives uh, on streams and things like this, a recording of this. So thank you all again very much. It's really appreciated and have a good evening or a good morning, depending on wherever you are. So, and David's gonna go back to his, uh, he's gonna go back to the sheep to make sure that they've been, the work's been finished on the farm. Thanks everybody. Congratulations to us. Thank you. Thanks. Cheers, everyone. Thank you, Leah. And I should have said thank you to everybody in the background, the ISA team and the LIAP team. They've done a fantastic job in supporting us. Any of the errors that have occurred is due to my moderating and, the, and managing the technology. So thanks very much, everybody. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye.